Hi there, I'm Frederick Van Johnson. A unique treat for you guys today. I'm sitting here at NAB 2014 with my good friend, Mr. Vincent LaFerre here, and Sage Nishimura is uh, from Sony. Sage, what's your position at Sony? Uh, I do marketing. Marketing? We do, we do marketing for professional cameras. Awesome. We do $10,000. Awesome. And Vincent, Vincent is a director producer. What are you? Would you like? Cinematographer, you're the uh, jack of all trades. Jack of all trades. I primarily make my living now directing commercials Very and cool. short films once in a while. But uh, used to be a photographer, yeah. journalist, and all that stuff. So we're going to talk about all that stuff. But the the purpose of this conversation is I want to talk about from a high level just the state of cinematography. The from the standpoint, I mean, that's a broad question, right? But from this from the standpoint of when you started, say, with rubber ring, right, and you sort of broke that ground and people were like, oh, I didn't know that was possible, right, to where we are now. Are things, when you made that film, are things creatively and what people are doing, is it going in the direction that you wanted it or that you foresaw back then? I think creatively everything's fine, yeah. you know, in terms of people creating beautiful work. Yeah. That, uh, you know, it's more accessible than ever before. Mm -hmm. uh, the barriers to entry have been lowered tremendously. The technical quality you get off of any of these 4K cameras, uh, a lot of these formats are really, really quite impressive. Yeah. Um, so on a creative level, it's super positive. Yeah. On a business level, on a making a living level, that's where things are a little bit more in turmoil because, um, you know, one case in point, the, the iPhone came out seven years ago and tried to imagine a life today, you know, without the iPhone and, or smartphones right. and how that's changed all of our lives and what we do, how we consume information, how we disseminate it, how we communicate, interact. And that's where I think we're, everyone's trying to find their footing and that, that affects cinematography and the business um, and the camera world. Yeah. What about in terms of getting up to speed? Because I remember like the five, six, seven years ago, the the kind of thrust of what photographers were going through was the idea, okay, I'm still a photographer. Now I, I have to learn this brand new skill set and all the things that go with it. And that's, you know, the language of editing, sound, managing that, even down to storage of these large, gigantic files. What about that? You know, looking at that, is have those sort of the training and that some piece people, of it? Some people have done it successfully. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, some people have not enjoyed it and left. Yeah. Um, I remember, you know, we've seen these weird things where, you know, they hand uh, iPhones or smartphones to reporters sometimes mm -hmm. and say, you are now our new photographer. Yes. You know, there's a, a, a disturbing respect for craft these mm -hmm. days. Right. Or lack of respect. Lack of respect. And um, the same goes with most of what we all do. You know, everyone thinks they can do everything. Right. You know, they think that if you buy a camera, you're instantly a cinematographer or a director. And the reality is, it is a craft that you have to learn and master over, you know, de decades, really. Yeah. Um, and, um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and the, the challenge for people is to try to find their footing. You know, newspapers are no longer really print papers. You read them online, at least I do. You consume them on tablets and on mm -hmm. phones. Mm -hmm. That's changed radically. So people that are putting websites up want content that's moving, not just still. Right. So there's a general movement in that direction. But no one really seems to know exactly where we're going. Because we have to, you have to look at our industry and how technology affects it as well. So Google's business model and most models today are give everything away for free. Get customers, spread their information, freemium, and that's how you're going to make your money. And that finds its way down in the creative sphere and creates a bit of turmoil. Yeah. Now, Sage, from your your <clears throat> perch over at Sony, you, you see movements in the chaos, right, Where in, from a marketing standpoint. Right. Look at the photographers, like what we were just talking about mm -hmm. here, photographers that are, that are coming into this space mm -hmm. that were traditionally, say, DSLR shooters right. Or you know even mirrorless these days, or they're out there capturing images, and now they're trying to move into the motion right. space. Right. What are the challenges for them? Is it like Vince is saying? You know, it's not just the proposition of mm -hmm. buying. Hey, I saw all this gear that this famous photographer is using. I'm going to go buy that, and I'm going to be like him. What What do you think? Well, I'll try to make the story short. But sure. uh, if we recall back in those days when the first digital camera came out, mm -hmm. people were freaking out like, Oh my God, you know. No more, no more still cameras necessary. Right. right. You know, right. professionals are gone. It wasn't true. You know, as I agree to Vincent, you know, there's a craftsmanship. Yeah. There's this certain, first of all, most of all creativity that is necessary as a professional. Yeah. And then, along with the technology, um, 
first of all, technology is now catching up to the needs of this craftsmanship. Mm -hmm. so that's one area. Yes. And then I told you there's a total bunch of people who buy the camera, and then they're like, geez, what am I doing with this? Yeah. So the challenge will be, in a massive way, how are we going to, of course, professionals are professional. They figure out something anyway. Right. You're right. Sense. Of course. Yeah. But then there's the lost people that we have to offer them a kind of easy, easier workflow, easier operation. So I'm not really worried about that is going to affect the real professionals, because the real professionals, they have their own craftsmanship anyway. So mm -hmm. yeah. that's the picture I've seen right now. What about the sort of the, you know, when you look at the, the tools that are available to mm -hmm. us today, you know, both software, right. you know, even distribution online, the internet, um, a lot of photographers that I talk to are struggling with, how, what do I get? You know, and my, you know, from my layman standpoint, my guidance is, well, why don't you start putting in? What are you trying to do? And then work backwards. Right. How do you say? How do you guide people in there when they say? Because hey, I'm sure you get it all the time. Right. Hey, what camera should I buy? I mean, right. should, should they get a big, massive camera, all that their budget can handle, and then grow into it, right. or should they start small and iterate? I think in the past, as a manufacturer, we were very much obligated to try to teach people, let people learn, to get away from those problems. But yeah. these days, uh, thanks to the internet. Mm -hmm. and the community, they already got get onto the Google before we touch them. Yeah, and they talk to each other. Yeah. And they find a way to get some you know, solutions, actually. Yeah. 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 So that is pretty much you know, the direction we're looking forward at. No longer manufacturers are going to spend so much money on trying to reach massive people. And you know, a lot of them don't need those information sometimes. It just goes to the trash can. Right. People who are really in trouble are really you know, in trouble in a certain place. And I believe that uh, other than a manufacturer, People like you know where they are. Actually. Yeah, right. Yeah, and because we've all been there at different times. So you work in different times, and you work in the really interesting segment, which is that ten thousand dollar and under right. number, mm -hmm. which is probably the most competitive. Which is the most massive people that are that are getting into this are in that bracket. Mm -hmm. And to me, that ten thousand dollar number nine 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 point nine nine is the number I call. That's as you, anything under ten thousand, you can excuse to your significant other. Mm -hmm. Or say it was a mistake. Some I people will that. argue with that. Of course, some people's definitely but point for almost <laughs> anybody. If you break that ten thousand dollar point, that's like a capital investment. Sure. That's you know like buying a car, right? Or getting into you know real estate. Yeah, you know? exactly. So it's a big deal. Uh, it's a very big deal, and there's so much competition now. You know, not only in my field as a creative, but in your field as a manufacturer. There's uh, every every year at NAB, there are new people that are now making cameras, mm -hmm. and you say to yourself, Do we really need more cameras? Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think what we need more of is people who have to understand that film and motion is not about the stuff we have behind me that's easy to just play my still images mm -hmm. that have a set duration, which is none. Right. You can look at a photograph for a millisecond, you can look at it for years. Yeah. And you choose as the viewer how long you're going to watch that. And the idea behind it could be very serious. It could be a journalism image. It could be uh, something to do with some some activist or some theme that's going on in society or the world, it could just be a picture of a sunset. That's the beauty, inherent beauty of photography is that there may be a deep message, but it doesn't have to be interpreted that way. Whereas a piece of motion is a set duration. And your job as a filmmaker or creator is to make sure that people keep watching and don't change the channel or go to the next Google channel right. on YouTube. And it's a very different craft. You know, um, one of the things I recently shot was a commercial for Nike where we were moving these cameras very fast around these Olympic athletes. Mm -hmm. And um, you are severely challenged as a director to find ways, we were shooting at 500 frames a second, mm -hmm. so things look like they're not moving. So you've yeah. got to move cameras really fast right. with these fast moving subjects to make it look like it's in motion. Yeah. And we were pushing the envelope in terms of how fast and how safely we can push the cameras into new angles that are as dynamic as possible. Mm -hmm. And what I realized during the shooting that commercial is how much I've learned in set six, seven years since I've gone into motion about not just working with actors, not just producing you know, films or videos or commercials, not just the financial, the promotion, the politics, mm -hmm. but just about moving the camera. So how and when and why you move the camera. Every move with a camera has a specific effect. Yeah. If I push in on you, mm -hmm. it has a certain psychological effect to the audience versus pulling back, right. versus doing a parallax move around you. And uh, I recently broke my arm which I'm doing better now. And I had several months to just watch all my favorite films. So I'm actually, out of that, I'm doing a workshop this, this spring and summer. Cool. It's actually a tour around the country. It's 31 cities. And it's called the Directing Motion Tour. Oh, perfect. And it's 10 hours of looking at all the masters. Scorsese, Spielberg, Coppola, Hitchcock, 
Orson Welles, you name it, Terry Gilliam, uh, Ridley Scott, and analyzing how they move the camera, but really analyzing. And that kind of speaks to what we're talking about in that it goes back to the craft. Yeah. It's saying, you guys move the camera all too often just because you can. Yeah. I call it the Michael Bay style. You know, the camera's just <laughs> flying around and loops and loops and loops. Right. You don't really know why. It looks really cool. Yeah. It's wonderful eye candy. And put some slow motion in there, too. Right. It's not <laughs> storytelling. You know, dozens of explosions and robots. Of course. And when you actually get to the point where you want to tell a story, you need to have that knowledge. And it goes back to the idea that directing or being a director of photography is a craft. You not only need to know as a director of photography about lighting and composition, you also need to understand how to move the camera yeah. and when not to. When there's a very intense dialogue piece, you want to stop moving the camera so people can concentrate because what the audience always looks at is people's eyes, which is why one other thing we're covering is like coverage. Mm -hmm. You know, we start a little wide because the audience watching a, a four cornered screen doesn't know the environment, yeah. and then you continuously go tighter to medium shot and then to a close up because you want to see the person's right. eyes. It's it's like when I look at you or you, I'm looking right in your eyes, mm -hmm. not looking at your shoes. Right. You know, right. when we get here, we look around the environment, and you realize how a lot of this stuff in terms of motion is uh, a essentially a universal language that, ironically, everyone knows. Yeah. We're not taught it, but we all consume so much television and films these, these days and videos that weird. we intrinsically understand how the camera moves and how, what it does to us. But when you get behind the camera, whether you're an amateur or photographer, suddenly a certain thing like, well, panning. Why do we pan? Well, we turn our heads left and right our whole lives. We don't go up. We don't tilt up or down that much. It hurts your mm -hmm. neck, and there's not much to see in the sky. Yeah. Unless something's dropping on you, yeah. or a bird. And the floor, you look so you don't trip. And most of the time, you're going left to right, which is what 95% of filmmaking is right. panning left to right. And then you study basic psychology and say, first time I got a camera, I'm there with a, with a fluid head tripod, and I'm like, do I pan left or pan right? 50-50, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. No. If you pan from left to right, uh, that's the direction we read in, in our, at least on the Western culture. Mm -hmm. and in, it's just in Hollywood in general, it feels more comfortable than when you pan from right to left. It's a psychological thing. So that's kind of what we're diving in, from a basic level of like panning all the way down to fancy moves. But see all that, all that stuff, this is psychological, this is the psychology of moving the camera, um, you know, all that stuff that you just said. How do, how do photographers get that in their head? Well, in other words, looking at... It's very hard. There's not much material out there. Right. There aren't very many books. There aren't very many workshops. Part of why I'm doing this tour, yeah, uh, because I love it. I've studied it for my entire life. Mm -hmm. I get to work with other directors as a DP sometimes, uh, and I learn from them, and I learn from the masters. And it is a real education that reinforces what a director does. Yeah. And that's just one segment. It's a very important segment, though. So where is this? Where is this work? So when is this workshop taking place? And it where? starts May third or fourth or fifth, yeah. and it's going all around the country in every major city. For nine weeks. Is there a URL for people? Uh, so? Directing motion. Directing motion. Yeah. Dot com. Dot com. Yeah. Oh. Just uh, that, that, that so, works. So that's one of the that and say, Joe, you have you chime in on this too? Because that the whole idea of all these different pieces. This just scared me, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, from photographers that are saying, you know what, I want to dabble in this motion right. stuff. I could do that. It's yeah. just you know I already know how to light. Yeah. I'm just gonna you know it's just lighting in thirty frames a second. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so and you know that's what a lot of people think. So how, how from your standpoint, how do they, aside from going to Vincent's workshop, get their brain around shooting this kind of stuff, or, or moving from still? In other words, moving from the still wor world of a sixtieth of a second and you're out mm -hmm. to thirty frames a second and you have to tell a story. Mm -hmm. How do they do that? Well, because it, I mean, just well, books or shooting mileage, you know. <laughs> well. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to answer your question directly, but obviously uh, there are so many photographers compared to videographers in terms yeah. of population. Sure. And a recent uh, marketing study, obviously, is that photography is getting very difficult to live on, just photography, still shots, because of smartphones and everything out there. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of professional still uh, cameramen is forced to move on to moving motion pictures. Yeah. And uh, depending on what kind of client they used to have, they could be designers, they could be food, it could be commercials, it could be anything. Mm -hmm. So depending on that, their demand changes. Mm -hmm. And these, I've been working on photography in the documentary section. Now I'm moving to motion pictures. Yeah. Well, my customer is BBC. I need uh, 4, to, 4, to, 4, to, 4 to 0, for example. Yes, that's exactly. how it starts. Yeah. So it really depends on the application the customer is involved in. Mm -hmm. So yeah. unfortunately, we, can, we try our best to provide a dream camera. Yeah. But the reality is, Depending on each individual customer, they have different demands, yeah. unfortunately. 
It's like buying a camera bag, right? There's no right camera bag. <laughs> you know? true, true. There's always all these different kinds of bags. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's a really interesting world. So what about this? There's one thing to go back to, oh, yeah, go for it. which is that don't get afraid with all this stuff. This is you know when I'm this directing motion tour, what I'm discussing about moving the camera. That's learning the craft. That's mm -hmm. normal. In the same way that if I if I you were sitting with me, we talked about tilt shift lenses mm -hmm. and how to use them, or wide angle versus telephoto, or different mm -hmm. angles of light, mm -hmm. and how if you shoot the same scene from every different angle, mm -hmm. you can really learn about lighting. Mm -hmm. Not moving anything, just move yourself yeah. and exposure. <coughs> Excuse me, my daughter gave me a cold <laughs> uh, a number of times in a row. Um, but the key is that what you have to always go back to is that a still photograph can be just a shot that you don't really have an idea of in terms of when you shoot it. You just photograph it because it looks interesting mm -hmm. and you can let it be. Mm -hmm. Every, whether it's food photography or videography, whether it's uh, weddings, it's whether it's all about a story. Yeah. Yeah. That's the key. Yeah. So people always have to say, you know, no matter, you don't need to move the camera, but you do need to have a good story. Yeah. Because the idea is, the story is the foundation. Even in, a, it, even in a still shot, though, right? Yeah, yeah, less so. It's so. less critical. Exactly. It's critical in motion sure. because you have to garner someone's attention. You can only do that with so much eye candy. Yeah. There has to be some sort of narrative thread mm -hmm. or some sort of direction you're going, in, and that's what motivates motion. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, it's a big word we use in directing is motivation. Mm -hmm. So if someone walks in the frame, that motivates the camera to start right. with them. Or it motivated me to choose a wide angle because I want to see the environment in the background versus choosing a telephoto and blowing out the background that I found distracting. Right. And it's all, how does this serve the story? So no matter what you're doing, you shouldn't worry about 420 or H.264 or this codec. You should really say, what is it I'm trying to say? Because I tell people who want to learn how to do this, is I pick the, pick the simplest camera you can, pick your smartphone, mm -hmm. and try to shoot something with that and edit it. And don't worry about the technical stuff. And that's why it's, it's good to get these cameras that keep coming out. To, so you don't have to worry about the technical it's, stuff. You know, it's really kind of offending, but you know, people, some people worry about 10B or 8B, but mm -hmm. if you're doing 4K, you got to yeah. worry about focusing. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Can you back to the focus? Yeah. Yes. It's so hard. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, that's, you know, so and that's the technical stuff. So that when you when you learn with these cameras, yeah. you're so focused on keeping it focused yeah. Yeah. or getting a sharp image mm -hmm. that all the storytelling goes out the door very quick yeah. because you're so focused. Like, oh, it's blurry. It's not what I do. Da, da, da. Mm -hmm. And you start designing your film around what you can and cannot do. You get the weeds. Yeah. yeah. And that's the danger. Yeah. yeah. The beauty for the photo steel picture cameras. They already have the lens asset yeah. for years and years, including classical lenses. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so technology is finally catched up. Yeah. You know, before you can tell video captured still picture. Right. It was a joke. Right. 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 Today yeah. it's different. Different no, story. You can't tell. Now, so you have the camera lenses already in mm -hmm. your hand. Now we have, as you know, the press event yesterday, we told, we tried to tell the public that. Now we are focusing also on the moving pictures, motion pictures. Mm -hmm. That's why we have an alpha mount system. Yeah. That's literally accepting any lenses. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. Any lens you name it. So the what I'm trying to make a point is the creativity or craftsmanship, the steel camera already has this great asset. Before we couldn't do that for under ten, over ten thousand camera. Only in the Hollywood area, yeah. they have interchangeable lenses. And anything like yeah. below that $10,000 exactly. mark, so, we knew that it was amateur. So I think uh, the manufacturer's uh, obligation is to try to provide the motion machinery that can utilize people's assets, steel cameras' assets, and help them in terms of craftsmanship. Yeah. 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 Well, one, to close this off, um, and Vincent, I want, I want to talk about your commercial, because we're going to run it at the end of this interview. Okay. Um, but the, the there's this movement, for lack of a better word, in image making of doing these hybrid sort of pieces. And you remember back in the, it was, I, there's been many names, you know, of, of combining stills with motion, and then, you know, we see selective motion where there's a still of video, and then some motion is moving in the frame. Is that, a, is that like a fad from you? Because you guys are like authorities in this. So is this, is it a move, is this like a new art form or is I, it? I don't like making a blanket statement that something's a fad or is not worthwhile. Yeah. That's my initial reaction. Mm -hmm. But how, I hear a however. <laughs> however, you've got to give things a chance. I mean, we are in, in a time where things are changing at an unprecedented pace, mm -hmm. where we're trying to figure things out, we're trying to engage people, mm -hmm. and there's no reason you can't have an image that's, that has a still image combined with motion mm -hmm. that could potentially engage people in a very new way. You know, definitely on an advertising level. And storytelling. It, you know, it's, it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, has it picked up? No. 
Um, mostly because it's limiting in how you can tell a story. It becomes a bit more just eye candy. Mm -hmm. uh, but never say never, you know, yeah. and it, it's, um, I haven't seen that much stuff that's like, I can point to these four examples, like this is the future of storytelling yet, right. you know, and um, in the same way that photographers would get video cameras. And to them, it's like it's a whole new business, mm -hmm. you know, and you say, so you know, there's this thing called filmmaking. It's been around just as long as photography, if not a little bit longer. Um, well, not longer, but it's the two histories are totally combined. Yeah. And uh, those people have been doing this as long as we've been doing photography. So maybe new to you, but there's people out there, you know, who know a heck of a lot more about motion than you do. And you, when I t when I teach workshops, I tell people, especially still photographers, you are supposedly, if theoretically, if you're a professional photographer, well versed in uh, graphic composition, color, geometry, the light. And you're entering a world where it's all about combining that with motion and story. Mm -hmm. Don't lose what you bring to the table because they all do. Mm -hmm. I've done workshops where I tell them, I'm going to tell you this at the beginning of the workshop. You're, you're going to look at the stuff you shot today. At the end of the day, I'm going to ask you, do you like any of the frames you shot? And you're going to be no. Mm -hmm. So make an effort of making it beautiful. And it goes by the wayside because they get so involved in technical stuff. Yeah. But don't forget that there's an entire field that's been there for you know over a hundred years. Yeah. And people think it's new because so it they're is. just now getting the capabilities in their in their cameras. Right. Now. Yeah. yeah. So so Vincent, tell me about this uh, your Nike commercial. We watched yeah. it uh, before. Yeah. We kind of did a little private Vincent Lafferie screening yeah. of the commercial. Yeah. So tell me about the logistics behind planning something like this. It's insane. Yeah. You know. So first of all. Um, it, it's uh, it's well into a seven figure salad, uh, budget, mm -hmm. uh, wow. and you have all these really incredible athletes: Kobe Bryant, uh, Allison Felix, uh, Ashton Eaton, Richard Sherman, um, Mo Farah, and you basically have four 12-hour days to shoot these athletes with the most complex equipment you can find in the cinema. Mm -hmm. You've got close to 100 people working with you. As the director, you have to figure out how to translate what the client wants to do into something you actually can shoot that's dynamic and visual, mm -hmm. uh, that highlights the athletes. Um, and there's just a tremendous amount of work from casting extras in the background to finding the right location mm -hmm. to having these incredible plans to fit you know, someone in the morning, someone in the afternoon, and finding out one athlete's only available and the, they're both available in the morning. Yeah. And, um, it's a fascinating job. I've got to say, my brain has never been tested as much as when I've gone to this, this commercial and directing field. How do, how do these jobs come down, though? I mean, this is because this one was, you know, the, the slow motion is beautiful. In there. What was it? Five hundred. What, what Five hundred frames. Five hundred frames. Six. Yeah. It's insane. So, do does Nike come to you as a DP and they say, you know, we we need to sell more shoes. Can right. you help us? Or do they come to you and say? Here's a storyboard of what our executives have approved, and we'd like you to make this come to life. It happens in all sorts of ways. Usually, uh, they have a general idea of what they'd like to do, and it's your job. This one is a job I actually directed, and I worked with a DP on this. Yeah. And um, you basically have to translate that vision to something you can execute, and you usually generally write a treatment. This is how I would shoot this for you. This is how I, the, the technical stuff I would do. This is it's almost like a proposal. So visual, it's a definite proposal. You're pitching yourself. Yeah. And if you make it past that round, I usually pick their, their three top directors, then you get conference calls and you discuss it over the phone and you click or you don't, you yeah. know, and then yeah. you get to bidding it with the two other directors. Yeah. And then, you know, whoever has the right number with the right talent gets hired to do it. It's a whole process. So by the time I set foot on that Nike set, I'd put six weeks of work into it. Wow. If not seven or eight, actually. How does the talent work, though? So Kobe Bryant, yeah. and does, does Nike make that happen, or is it is all this on you? Yeah, so they literally, you know, we're told you've got 45 minutes to maybe one hour with every one of these athletes, and they, they're literal. Like, at 45 minutes and 15 seconds, there's a guy walking up to you saying, actually, it comes at 30 minutes, if not 15. He's like, how are you doing? You done? Yeah. yeah. I'm like, you told me I had 45 minutes, you know? Uh, it's like... So, and, and uh, Nike really cares about their athletes. Yeah. Uh, they treat them like gold, as, as they should. And you're told, you know, um, if you shoot something that's amazing, but our athlete, you know, is unhappy or gets injured, that's not a success for us. Mm -hmm. If you shoot something that's great or amazing or just okay, but the athlete has a great time, we value that. So, uh, the goal is always to shoot something that's amazing and make the athlete happy. So it's, it's a total balancing act. And that's why as a director, I surround myself with great line producers and DPs and operators so that, you know, even though we had two cameras and 
you know, Steadicam operator is one of the top in, uh, in the world. Mm -hmm. We had one small technical issue, and then we had nine hours to rehearse. Something happened, and I'll walk over to Kobe and remind him that when I was 19 years old and he was similar in age, uh, I photographed him. Mm -hmm. And I, I said, do you remember talking about prosciutto and sorbosada? Because he just come back from Tuscany and so had I. He was like, gee, yeah, he remembered, you know? And <laughs> connection. Could I find a connection? Yeah. And I photographed him when he, when he played his first games and against Michael Jordan and when he won his gold medal at the Olympics. Nice. And you make a connection. That's a two-minute conversation while they, they're frantically pulling cables out of the camera to make it work. Right. And then they're, they tap you on the shoulder, like, okay, here we go. <laughs> yeah. it's, and yeah. it's all about finding that, that kind of... That, uh, that balance. That, that's crazy. But see, when you when you hear stuff like that, I mean, from your approach in marketing, you know, does, it, does that resonate with you that it's just like this sort of giant ball of wax? Actually, my customers, I believe, that's high for me. Yes. What just means yeah. I told about it. More like not big name companies, more like more small producers. Mm -hmm. They get phone calls from clients like, hey, can you come to Japan tomorrow? Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. What about the storybook? Well, you can think it on my mind. Exactly. Yeah. And I deal with that too. Yeah. Well, you yeah. know. So it's not just brave, but physically, they're, yeah. they're in a very tough condition. But I don't know, by providing them small cameras and light cameras, less yeah. or complex, complex cameras, yeah. Yeah. easy to operate on Macintosh and the computers, yeah. that's I think we can provide them to make their life easier. Yeah. Yeah. That's our job. And yeah, I've heard about that kind of story a lot. Yeah. And, and, and that's crazy high and I deal with, you know, I get calls, hey, Marsh is in tomorrow. And again, like, what's your concept? Oh, we don't know, we're still working on it. And that that scares me, but I turn down those jobs. <laughs> you know, if you don't have like, a concept, whoa, whoa, there's whoa. not much I can do for you as a director, you know? Because yeah. uh, I, I can't move the camera in a certain way because I don't know what I'm shooting. Yeah. Uh, but we all deal with that and the reality is you just want the cameras to work. Right. You know, if yeah. you're seeing us now, it's because the cameras worked. Yep. You know, if you're not seeing us, well, you don't know about it. But <laughs> exactly. the point is, this could be a reshoot, and that's yeah. what we can't do. We just want the cameras to work. We yeah. want the image to look wonderful mm -hmm. and to be easy on our backs. Yeah. And that's really what, what this technology should be about. So last final question here. Yeah. Um, Vincent, so a day in the life, Vincent Lafferty, you're on, you're on set. Yeah. How many people are there? Like, say, take the, the Nike job. Right, the Nike project. How many people are there on set, and how much are you behind the camera, or are you directing? Are you I'm behind the monitors. So okay. the, the the rule as a director, generally speaking, is you want to be looking at the monitors, and then looking at your crew, so you can give them feedback if something's not working mm -hmm. to direct them and yeah. and to speed them up or slow them down or having start a different position and somewhere else, yeah. make a different arc, whatever it is. But you're by the monitors, and um, my favorite quote. If I see if I can remember it. But um, I think it was Travolta that said, being a director is like volunteering to have 100 chickens pecking on your head, you know, <laughs> to, to pecking your head to death. You know, I have 86 people on set that usually, if you've done your job right, they're not asking you questions on the day of because you've done it pre-production. If you haven't done your job, they're asking it to you while you're shooting and your mind is exploding. Love so, it. Yeah, preparation. preparation. It's all about preparation. Sage, where would you like people to go to Check out the stuff that you were responsible for. I'm assuming it's somewhere at Sony, right? Well, first of all, NAB show. NAB, we have, yes. We have all hands on. We went to wherever. And this is the opening day for NAB, yeah, right? It's yeah. First day. Yeah. Lots of traffic in the booth. Mm -hmm. yeah. Other than that, um, anyway, if you're talking about US, uh, PH. Yeah. <laughs> anyways, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's a recognizable mm -hmm. brand. <laughs> And Vincent, you got the workshop coming up. Yeah. Any other projects you want to So talk there's about? a directing motion tour. Then there's also my blog, blog.vincentlaferre.com. Which has been going forever, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, it's still there, still kicking. Nice. And nice. Uh, that's basically it. Or Twitter, you know, at Vincent Lafre. It's pretty much where I'm the most active. And you'll see anything on Twitter, so. Anything to get people in trouble. Especially you. <laughs> yeah, I know. All right, we're going to end it right there. All right, guys, thank you both for taking it. I know it's a crazy trade show day, opening day. Sage, so thank you for coming. My pleasure. My to come here. Yes, thank you. And Vincent Lafre, same thing. I know you were thanks. going a mile a minute today, so thanks for coming on. Cheers. All right. That's it, guys. We'll let these guys get back to what they do. That's it for this session. My name is Frederick Van Johnson. We'll see you in the next interview.